Hello, my name is Marcus Butler. I am uh, here on this webinar to present the evolving landscape of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma treatment, updates in immunotherapy treatment. Uh, today, this is an imedicus.ca uh, webinar. Uh, if you click on the Interact Live, you can send questions to us by chat. You can also uh, text us by uh, texting 514-612-5959, or you can email questions to questions at imedicus.ca. Uh, and uh, you can send any of these questions to us uh, throughout the program. Uh, halfway through, we'll stop and answer some of the questions and then uh, complete the remainder of the uh, session. And then we will um, uh, give a little bit more uh, information and then uh, uh, we'll have more uh, time for questions at the end. You can go to imedicus.ca. Uh, for the online evaluation form that I uh, would like you to please uh, fill out at the end of the uh, session. And also there are links to the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma resources that can be found on the Melanoma Network of Canada website. So the learning objectives for today are to describe updates on standard of care for, and links to resources about cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. In, uh, improve your knowledge of uh, and overview of treatment, and to better understand the specific needs of patients with this diagnosis, as well as treatment and side effect of the uh, side effects of the treatments that we provide patients. The uh, format is to uh, spend about 20 minutes talking about uh, squamous carcinoma treatment and management up to the recent data on immunotherapy. Uh, then we'll answer some questions, uh, then uh, 20 minutes uh, reviewing the recent data on immunotherapy using anti-PD-1 drugs for uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. The entire webinar should take about an hour. So I'd like to start with a case of a patient uh, that we took care of uh, at uh, Princess Margaret. This gentleman is an 85-year-old gentleman with a history of squamous carcinoma of the left cheek. He actually presented uh, in the summer of 2018 with about a decade's history of an abnormal lump that was on his cheek that he basically uh, didn't bother him, so it, he didn't bother anyone else about it. Uh, he did uh, have a strong history of sun exposure, no other uh, uh, cancers. Um, uh, other than a stage two colon cancer that was resected in 1995. Uh, in August of 2018, the lesion began to grow and it was resected and found to be a two centimeter moderately differentiated squamous carcinoma. The margins were positive. Uh, his oncologist planned to do radiation therapy and uh, began the radiation, but uh, very early during the uh, treatment, he developed progression. He then was seen uh, at Princess Margaret where uh, physicians did an extensive surgery to achieve resection. Uh, they found a four centimeter tumor that was multifocal with multiple uh, uh, local uh, metastases. Also uh, lymph nodes were removed and, and were positive at the time. There was paraneural invasion. They then proceeded to radiation after he healed from the large graft, but actually uh, very early during the period of uh, radiation, uh, he had uh, further progression with lesions developing on his chest wall as well as locally. Um, we uh, uh, discussed with him the possibility of cetuximab concurrent with chemotherapy, but decided to monitor, and then he developed uh, the progression. Actually, uh, at this time, we did not have anti-PD-1 therapy as an option for patients. Uh, he had significant suffering. He went to palliative care, and the plan was to proceed with uh, medical assistance in dying uh, because uh, he was having so much discomfort. Uh, late in February, however, we uh, were able to obtain anti-PD-1 therapy for this patient and we decided to, dis, uh, to skip MADE for the, or delay it and try simiplumab. 
Uh, this is an example of the chest wall lesions that he had at the time, as well as lung mets that were seen uh, prior to beginning simiplumab. And then after four doses, he had uh, uh, near complete resolution of the lesions on his chest wall as well as uh, lung. Uh, he also had other improvements and actually began having improvement within a couple of weeks of his first dose of therapy. The patient continues to do well, is on simiplumab. He, he does note modest fatigue, but has not had uh, 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 significant uh, toxicity. So cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is a malignant proliferation of epidermal keratinocytes. It is the second most common type of skin cancer behind basal cell. Like basal cell, it's associated with sun exposure, advanced age, uh, sensitive skin to UV radiation. It's also more common in patients who are immune suppressed. There are precursor le lesions. Actinic keratosis uh, can be dealt with, uh, with local therapy and is a precursor to cutaneous uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, in situ disease is also called Bowen's disease. There are examples of de novo uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, they can often be found in patients who have irradiated skin or radiation dermatitis. Uh, also, chronically inflamed skin can be associated with uh, uh, developing uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The uh, uh, incidence of uh, CSCC appears to be increasing, most likely associated with prior sun exposure as well as the fact that we have an aging population. The epidemiolog epidemiological data is actually incomplete because we don't uh, historically have not been uh, collecting data on this diagnosis um, as carefully as we had with other diseases. The majority of, of uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma are found in the head and neck uh, lesion. And the reason that the data is incomplete is it's a very good prognosis, highly curable in its early stages, can be resected and patients do very well. And therefore, many times a patient is seen in an outpatient dermatology or family practice uh, setting uh, and not in a cancer center. It's estimated, and this may be a high estimate, that uh, two to five percent of patients will develop nodal metastases, and uh, estimates uh, suggest that disease-specific death occurs in about one to three percent of patients. So the vast majority of patients are very easily treated. Squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, uh, it, it, there are multiple types of histologies. The keratocanthoma is a dome-shaped nodule with a central keratin plug. This is a well-differentiated uh, lesion and rarely metastasizes, it's easily treated with surgery and has a less aggressive behavior. Uh, Verrucous uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is well-differentiated and resembles a large wart. Uh, uh, and can be locally metastatic, but uh, has, um, does not usually metastasize to distant sites. Spindle cell is also rare, observed on sun-exposed areas in the elderly. It is often confused uh, initially as a sarcoma or a melanoma, uh, fibrosanthoma. And uh, however, immunostains show cytokeratin and epithelial uh, antigens. Desmoplastic has a very highly infiltrative growth has perineural invasion and is associated with a high rate of metastasis. There are also other rare variants, the ancantholytic variant, uh, which has pseudo-granular uh, granular structures and is considered to be a squamous cell carcinoma. There's an adenosquamous, which is also considered to be squamous cell. It, it happens to express CEA, but it's not considered uh, to be an adenoma, but rather a, uh, a cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is relevant uh, as we look at uh, indications for various therapies. In terms of straight staging, there is no AJC staging for uh, cutaneous, uh, specifically for cutaneous squ uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Head and neck uh, uh, staging is for all non-melanoma uh, uh, skin cancers that includes um, uh, it, so that includes basal cell and Merkel cell. 
But in general, the smaller lesions, T1, are less than 2 centimeters, T2 are 2 to 4 centimeters, T3 are greater than 4 centimeters, and uh, T4 are when the uh, lesion has invaded into bone or marrow. Uh, in stage, if there's a single lateral on the same side, it's uh, 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 and less than three centimeter, that's N1. Uh, N2 is multiple nodes, or uh, uh, but or one node greater than three centimeters, and then uh, six centimeter nodes uh, is N3. In terms of prognosis, as I mentioned, the cure rate is very high, uh, greater than 90 percent. Uh, in some studies, the recurrence rate uh, can be around 5 percent, and 75 uh, percent of those recurrences occur within two years, so monitoring patients closely in the first two years is important. Um, and recurrence rate includes local recurrence, which can be uh, easily uh, dealt with uh, surgically. Uh, less than 3 to 5 percent develop metastatic disease, most commonly in the draining lymph nodes, but also it's possible to have metastases to the uh, uh, lung, liver, brain, skin, bone. And uh, when patients are immunosuppressed, either due to a hematologic malignancy such as CLL or due to medications that are administered for transplant or for rheumatologic conditions, uh, uh, risk of recurrence is higher. In terms of therapy, um, most lesions are, are uh, treated with local therapy very well. Uh, the precancerous lesions, the actinic keratoses and in situ carcinoma can be treated with surgery, imiquimod, 5-FU, photodynamic therapy, as well as cryotherapy, and these therapies can be very effective. Uh, small lesions that are invasive uh, can, should undergo assessment surgically uh, and can be res uh, resected. Most surgery is an option for some patients uh, when there is a, a, a tumor in a sensitive area. Uh, also, radiation therapy in uh, many cases is curative and needs to be considered. The large lesions with uh, high-risk features are associated with uh, uh, lymph node metastasis, so uh, physical exam or ultrasound assessment of draining lymph nodes is suggested. Sentinel node uh, biopsies is generally not recommended. There have been studies looking at sentinel node biopsy, and, up, and to date it is not a recommendation for standard management. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, further uh, issues with treatment, uh, adjuvant uh, or post-operative radiation therapy uh, is often considered when there is perineural invasion. Uh, also, if the uh, tissue margins are uh, not free of disease and further surgery is not uh, possible. I'm not a radiation oncologist, but the literature suggests that between 45 and 55 gray and daily fractions of 2 to 2.5 gray are recommended. Uh, radiation in the case of the uh, nodal basin after uh, node dissection is, uh, is, can be considered and is indicated when there are multiple nodes or extracapsular in involvement. Um, also, for small nodes without extracapsular involvement, uh, uh, observation with ultrasound uh, can be considered. In terms of systemic therapy to prevent recurrence, there currently is no standard of care option. However, there, is, uh, there are trials that are uh, being developed and being conducted to try to identify a way to prevent recurrence in high-risk patients. So how do we identify advanced uh, uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma? There's no formal definition, and this is relevant because a lot of the uh, new uh, labeled indications for drug require that you have advanced squamous cell carcinoma. In general, it's locally advanced with local progression. If it's not amenable to radiation or surgery, then it definitely qualifies as advanced. Or if there's metastatic disease, no one would quar uh, quarrel with that definition. Uh, there are limited options for these patients. In fact, in a German study, 60% of patients with advanced squamous skeletal carcinoma received no systemic therapy when they had metastatic disease. Prior to anti-PD-1, PD-L1 therapy, 
there have been no uh, systemic therapies that have shown a survival benefit or significant other benefit in large randomized studies for uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Most of the studies have, that are uh, uh, in the literature have been small case series. There are few randomized trials. Uh, things that can be considered include 5-FU uh, monotherapy, uh, and the s reports suggest that a good percentage of patients can have stability or uh, partial responses. Platinum agents also have activity uh, in these patients. However, uh, the responses are often short-lived, and especially for the elderly patients over seven, in their 70s or 80s or even 90s, consideration of, of a cytotoxic chemotherapy can be quite challenging. Other agents that have had some activity include bleomycin, methotrexate, adriamycin, gemcitabine, and other taxanes. Uh, there are several studies ongoing in immunotherapy, targeted therapy, as well as uh, systemic uh, chemotherapy, um, uh, and uh, these uh, certainly will provide uh, uh, information uh, downstream to look for additional options for patients. In terms of targeted therapy, uh, EGFR is overexpressed in uh, patients who have uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and overexpression uh, has been associated in some studies with a worse outcome. Uh, therefore, uh, in the last uh, decade or two, uh, drugs such as a cetuximab, a panitumumab, erlotinib, gemfetamid, and uh, dasatinib have been studied in, uh, have been used in head and neck uh, cancer, so uh, this has been investigated in patients, in, at least in examples in retrospective studies looking at uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, cetuximab uh, can be given uh, at the standard dose of 400 milligrams per meter squared for the first week and then weekly 250 milligrams per uh, meter squared. Uh, and it is associated with a fairly high disease control rate. In um, the, uh, this uh, randomized, it's not randomized, it was a single arm study of patients, um, about six, uh, 36 patients were treated. Uh, there was a partial response rate um, uh, of, um, of eight to 10 percent and a couple of patients who did quite well. Um, and uh, in the, when we look at best overall response for patients, that was within the first six weeks of treatment. But when you look at overall, about a third of patients had a partial response or, or complete response. About 50 percent of patients had uh, stabilization of disease. And then, uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, within several months uh, did have experience progression. So uh, cetuximab is definitely something to consider for patients with uh, CSCC. So uh, we now have a little bit of time to uh, answer some questions. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go with the first one, which is which systemic therapy uh, do you try first for advanced uh, uh, cutaneous uh, SCC? So um, that's a very good question. and. Uh, in general, I have not been using chemotherapy uh, for this patient population because the durability of response is low and toxicity is relatively high. Uh, if a patient has no contraindication, I will uh, uh, prescribe uh, uh, cetuximab uh, if they, sorry, I will prescribe semipolmab, the anti-PD-1 uh, inhibitor, which has achieved uh, Health Canada approval, and there currently is a compassionate program. If a patient has a, an exclusion, I'll try cetuximab. And uh, recently, I have a patient with a kidney transplant who I'm anxious about giving anti uh, immunotherapy to, uh, there's an anti PD1 therapy, uh, but in, in this case, I've tried cetuximab, and he does appear to be benefiting from it. So. Um, I think you have to have a discussion with uh, patients to review the options. Um, and what are the ma major challenges with systemic therapy or targeted therapy? Well, I think that the, the biggest challenge is the patient population. So if a patient is young and, and otherwise has no major comorbidities, 
uh, we're willing to uh, push the dose and allow uh, side effects. Um, but in the cases where patients are um, uh, quite, uh, have comorbidities or other challenges, uh, we will often um, uh, uh, make decisions that are they're different for that patient population. Unfortunately, for all of the treatment options, uh, there is the potential for side effects, so that has to be uh, balanced. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, we choose therapies uh, for these patients. There were um, some other questions. Um, so what is the appropriate follow-up for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in patients who uh, have been diagnosed uh, and uh, successfully treated? So um, for patients who have just all patients with a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, uh, after resection, uh, uh, close follow-up, especially for large uh, lesions, is uh, recommended. Uh, and uh, these patients are at risk of developing second primaries. Uh, in you know, a third of patients will have a, a recurrence. So uh, the, or have a new uh, lesion. Uh, so we see patients in clinic every six months or so, and the majority of local recurrences from the resected uh, site is, uh, occur within two years. So close follow-up in the first two years is recommended. Uh, also, we recommend patients avoid sun, uh, use sunscreens, uh, and other su uh, sun safety um, uh, uh, approaches. And then how do you determine uh, which patients are advanced and are appropriate for uh, further therapy? Basically, this is a decision that's uh, made based on uh, a discussion with the radiation oncologist and with the um, uh, surgeons on whether uh, the surgical or radiation options are practical for, for patients. There are also uh, some patients who have very uh, non-aggressive disease and may cho choose uh, to not undergo procedures or therapy, but rather be monitored closely uh, and wait for uh, further symptoms before um, um, uh, uh, performing additional um, uh, treatments which may be associated with toxicities. Okay, so I think we'll move uh, on. Again, I'll remind you if you would like to uh, send any questions, uh, you can click on the Interact Live button. Uh, there is also uh, text questions uh, to 514-612-5959, or you can email questions at imedicus.ca. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about immunotherapy. Now, uh, this is a curve that looks at the objective response rate in uh, patients with uh, single-agent anti-PD-1 immunotherapy compared to the mutational load that's present uh, in the tumor. And as you can see, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma has a very high response rate to immunotherapy. Uh, but it also has a very high uh, somatic mutation burden uh, when we sequence these lesions. So it turns out that, and it's not surprising, that uh, this is a disease which is uh, uh, generally caused by the presence of uh, UV damage, and uh, therefore there are more mutations that are present in the tumor. It's associated with uh, patients who are elderly, as well as the immune-suppressed environment. So these tumors are arising in, in a setting where uh, 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 the host is not able to control the growth of the tumor. Um, this is, we think, the reason why uh, these patients respond well to immunotherapy. Essentially, there's a defect in the immune system's ab ability to contain the tumor, we add a medication which allows the immune system to fight the cancer, and we see a high response rate in patients. 
There has been a lot of excitement about immunotherapy over the last uh, five to ten years. Uh, not only uh, gene therapy, cell therapy with the CAR T cells that have shown amazing uh, results in the liquid tumors, we're also seeing benefit in patients with solid tumors and as well as some hematologic malignancies by taking off the brakes of the immune system and allow the uh, tumor uh, to be seen and rejected by uh, the immune system. The way to understand uh, immunotherapy is first to think about what is involved in the immune response against the cancer. Initially, so it's the, the, most of the hypotheses on how the anti-PD-1 drugs are working is based on the concept that tumors express certain aspects or antigens that are taken up by the immune system. Those antigens are presented to uh, the immune system, most likely within lymph nodes or lymph node-like structures. That induces a T cell response and then the T cells are able to traffic back to the tumor where they can recognize the cancer that's expressing the antigen and induce killing. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, for um, uh, cutaneous uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, we think that many of the antigens are mutated antigens that are uh, de novo antigens that are completely recognized by the immune system as foreign uh, because they don't exist uh, in normal tissues. The problem with uh, Im uh, the immune response is that there are several elements of the immune system which actually put on the brakes and prevent the uh, T cell from recognizing the tumor. Uh, the two main uh, Health Canada approved drugs uh, that have shown benefit are uh, um, or types of drugs are the uh, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies and the anti-PD-1 antibodies. Uh, anti-PD-1 antibodies block a drug, uh, sorry, a molecule called uh, PD-1, which is present on T cells, and PD-L1, its binding partner, is present on tumor cells. What happens is that the PD-L1 prevents the tumor from recognizing that the, sorry, prevents the immune system from recognizing the tumor. And when we infuse patients with a antibody that blocks PD-1, it then removes that signal that the tumor is giving through PD-L1. So a PD-1 blocked T cell is able to secrete uh, a, a important anti-tumor cytokines such as TNF-alpha or interferon gamma. The T cell is able to secrete granzyme B and other uh, cytolytic uh, enzymes which results in the killing of the uh, target tumor. That interaction occurs by recognition of the tumor expressing uh, these tumor antigens, which allows for a specific response against the cancer. There are many ongoing studies uh, that are looking at ways to improve the response rates in patients uh, with uh, immunotherapy uh, targeting uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The field is moving now from the patients who are in the unresectable stage, uh, uh, advanced stage, to looking at patients who are at high risk of recurrence and treating patients with immune therapy to try to prevent um, um, the recurrence of disease. Several different drugs are being investigated uh, and have shown promise uh, in publications that I'll review shortly include the anti-PD-1 drug called semipalmab as well as uh, the anti-PD-1 drug uh, pembrolizumab which uh, has been shown to have anti-cancer effects. Uh, currently in Canada, the uh, uh, semipalmab has Health Canada approval. So semipalmab for the treatment of uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. The initial study that showed activity uh, published by Dr. Uh, Migden 
uh, was performed in patients with advanced uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. In this uh, study, uh, the best overall response was um, around 50%. There was uh, another good percentage of patients, about 15%, 20% who had stable disease. Uh, unfortunately, there is a group of patients who uh, experienced uh, further progression. But this has been uh, uh, very uh, encouraging and has resulted in further investigations to uh, look at uh, the durability of, of uh, these uh, uh, responses in patients. Uh, in terms of the characteristics of the patients in, in this study, uh, patients were elderly in their 70s um, with a median age of uh, 73 in the expansion group, and there was also a group of patients who had distant metastases and the median age was 71. Uh, there is a preponderance of males uh, in this patient population, most likely related to uh, sun exposure um, uh, and uh, balding. Primary site is uh, in the head and neck region in the majority of patients, 69% uh, and 64%, but can be seen on trunk, arms, legs, um, and otherwise um, uh, these patients had uh, uh, distant disease in a good percentage of patients who participated in this study. And despite the fact they had quite advanced disease, uh, we saw a high proportion of patients with uh, responses, uh, some patients with complete responses, as well as um, uh, some progression of disease. What's remarkable about uh, these results in contrast to the results that we see with semiplumab, sorry, uh, cetuximab, is that many of these responses can be very durable, lasting uh, uh, many, many months. And we have some follow-up data that we'll review in a moment, uh, which uh, shows that, which confirms this, what we've seen with uh, um, uh, uh, patients who have other types of skin cancers, such as melanoma, where you can see quite durable responses. Here's an example of some of the clinical um, uh, images that uh, we can achieve. So you can see here a patient with multiple uh, local metastases on the scalp who had a response within six, I think that's six weeks of therapy, as well as uh, a gentleman who had an uh, ulcerated lesion that showed healing with, with uh, treatment. So these responses can be quite remarkable and in many cases are durable. So there was additional uh, follow-up uh, from uh, this uh, study uh, in a phase two, uh, looking at patients in the group one. Uh, this, uh, the EMPOWER study is the semeplumab study, which looked at several different uh, situations. Group one was a group of patients who had metastatic disease. Group two, a group of patients who had locally advanced disease. And then group three was also metastatic, but switched the, um, uh, the way we're giving semiplumab to a flat dose given every three weeks. This is relevant because Health Canada has approved dose, these doses, and uh, many of us uh, medical oncologists are prescribing the flat dose as it does prevent wastage and is, uh, allows for ease of administration. On this study, patients needed to have a reasonable performance status of 0, 1. They had to have adequate uh, organ function, and they needed to have uh, resist measurable disease. Uh, they were excluded if they had prior immunotherapy. Um, they were excluded if they had ongoing autoimmune therapy, and they also were excluded if they had uh, other malignancies um, as well as uh, organ transplant. So the, for the first uh, follow-up information from group one, this was a group of patients with nodal or distant uh, disease. Um, in this uh, group of patients, the median age was 71, 54%, uh, sorry, 91% were male. Uh, most of the patients had ECOG-1 and the majority of patients had head and neck, which is representative of the patient population 
um, with a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this shows that the, uh, the type of, of metastases, actually most of these patients had distant metastases, not nodal metastases, so it was a, a pretty tough uh, group of patients. In terms of the response rate, so the October 2017 is the data that was presented in the New England Journal paper, so patients were monitored further. And in the this September uh, 2018, uh, there were um, uh, a few more uh, complete responses, and this occurs because patients can sometimes have a complete response several months after being treated. So 16% had CRs, 32% had PRs, and there was staple disease in the 15%. So what we're seeing here is that basically the responses improved with time as more and more patients had further shrinkage or disappearance of their tumor. And this is the waterfall plot that showed that a majority of patients had benefit of treatment either through stable disease, complete response, or, um, uh, or responses partial responses. And again, many of these treatments were durable. Patients were able to uh, continue on therapy and uh, uh, without uh, progression. There are patients who have, uh, have a, a response and then subsequent progression, but uh, many of the patients will have durable responses that can last um, many months. In terms of the progression-free survival, it's not yet reached. 52% um, uh, uh, have no progression at 12 months, and the median OS is not yet reached. And here are the survival curves showing that uh, patients are doing very well. There may be a flattening of the curve uh, in uh, PFS and uh, OS, uh, suggesting that some patients may not uh, have a further uh, progression or of their disease. Uh, in terms of adverse events, uh, this is important to note. Only about 5% of patients needed to stop drug uh, due to an adverse event, uh, or about 10% total. Um, sorry, 5%. And most of these were due to grade three uh, uh, toxicities. There were a few patients who had uh, grade one or grade two uh, toxicities that were felt to be intolerable uh, and then stopped. But the vast majority of patients are able to continue on treatment. The types of toxicities that we see are usually grade one or grade two. They should be taken seriously. It's not, you know, this is, there is the potential for a side effect that uh, is a major issue. Um, but about a third of patients may experience some diarrhea. It's rarely severe. Uh, fatigue is a common issue for patients. Uh, about 20% uh, of patients have fatigue. There's also uh, thyroid abnormalities around 10%. Uh, rash is common, cough. Uh, occasionally you can have pneumonitis or uh, liver uh, toxicity. And these uh, sort of uh, um, toxicities can be easily managed in people and, and physicians that are familiar with uh, this class of drugs. But certainly there was no significant difference between what we see with uh, the uh, other approved anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 drugs compared to simiplumab. So there was group three, which looked at patients with metastatic disease, similar to the group one patient population. But these patients then received flat dose simiplumab as opposed to the weight dosing. The other uh, plus is the flat dose uh, regimen is given every three weeks instead of the weight-based dose, which is given every two weeks. This was based on the fact that the uh, PK results in patients who participated on these studies um, and the phase one studies suggested that the dose uh, of the Q3, uh, sorry, Q2 week weight-based dose is very similar in terms of the amount of drug that gets into patients uh, on the Q3 weight-based dose. Uh, and on the basis of this, as well as the data that's been collected from patients on the weight-based dose, the Health Canada has allowed for uh, the 350 uh, regimen uh, for it drug administration. In this uh, study, there were again 
a good number of patients who benefited from therapy, complete responses, and uh, partial responses, basically in the 50% uh, uh, range. Uh, and most of the patients who develop responses have durable responses. This is very similar to melanoma, where about two-thirds of patients will have uh, durable responses. Unfortunately, about a third of patients have initial response and then progression. And in terms of adverse events, again, uh, very uh, similar uh, uh, to what we've seen uh, elsewhere uh, with uh, fatigue, occasional patients with diarrhea um, and rash. Uh, uh, we, you need to monitor patients to liver function tests as well as evidence for pneumonitis. Now, the, um, the phase two study, uh, this uh, multi-pronged phase two study also includes an arm for patients with locally advanced but not metastatic disease. Um, and these patients were treated with the weight base regimen every two weeks. And a similar patient uh, distribution, patients in their 70s um, uh, and um, uh, with a range of 45 to 96 percent. Majority of patients had head and neck disease, uh, but there were patients with extremity uh, lesions as well. Um, and the, this is relevant because the reasons why patients were not candidates for surgery included that there was uh, uh, extensive invasion, so it wasn't possible to do surgery. The surgery w uh, would have caused uh, a dysfunction and severe disfigurement in about 38% uh, of patients. Um, they had, um, had multiple surgical procedures, so it was felt that further surgery wasn't recommended. Um, and, and the reasons why patients weren't considered uh, eligible for radiation included prior radiation, so no further radiation would be possible. Uh, some uh, cases were felt to be unlikely to respond uh, or the risk, there was some soft language where basically the radiation therapists and patients to, uh, and physicians feel that the better option would be immunotherapy. And in this study, the complete response rate was around 10% again. The partial response rates for the group were 30% uh, with stable disease and another 35%. So the, the uh, objective response rate is a bit lower than the uh, distant metastasis group of around 43.6%. This is the waterfall plot for the locally advanced disease where you saw a lot of patients who had great response to therapy, uh, but there are some patients who had progression. And the swimmer's plot confirms that patients will uh, who benefit can continue to benefit long term. It's not just a response and then uh, quick uh, progression. Um, this next slide describes the, splits up the group based on the reasons why uh, they did not uh, respond. And I think this is, uh, or the reasons why they did not go on to surgery or radiation. So for lesions, there were, had significant local invasion that precluded complete resection out small numbers of patients. The uh, disease control rate was quite high and the objective response rate 50%. For patients that had disease that was in anatomically um, challenging locations, again, the response rate is what we're expecting around 50, uh, 56%. It was the patients who had had multiple surgeries uh, and were deemed to felt that further treatment would be unlikely to benefit, those patients actually had a lower uh, objective response rate. We're not sure why this is. Further real-world evidence, I think, uh, will be uh, useful as uh, this type of patient population is studied. Uh, but certainly, if, if this were true, then it would be a reason to consider systemic therapy in patients who are unlikely to benefit from, from treatment. But this is a special patient population. This is a patient population that's had multiple surgeries and yet has not had metastases. And there could be something biologically that's different about these patients. More research will be needed uh, in order to define uh, this patient population. So do we have a biomarker that can help us in terms of uh, therapy for patients? Um, the uh, 
basically there is no biomarker. Everybody can benefit from treatment. Uh, patients with uh, low PDL1 st uh, uh, staining, which is used in lung cancer and other tumors for identifying patients for, for therapy, these patients still have a good response to treatment, 35% uh, with uh, less than 1% PDL1 staining. So currently there is no biomarker. Certainly there is, this is an area of avid research where we will be looking at tumor mutational burden to identify patients who uh, may be uh, more or less uh, likely uh, to, to benefit. So uh, pembrolizumab, another anti-PD-1 therapy, has been uh, investigated in patients, and over the next few minutes I'll I'll uh, review some of this data from the CARSKIN uh, study. This was a study done in France where patients were given pembrolizumab in the Q3 week uh, flat dosing of 200 milligrams uh, uh, for patients. Uh, the, uh, the reason we're including this is there are a lot of patients in the U.S. who have access to pembrolizumab uh, for uh, cutaneous carcinoma, and there certainly is uh, promising results. There are also several studies looking at adjuvant and other uh, um, uh, indications uh, and settings for pembrolizumab that patients may be candidates for. In this study, again, uh, most patients were greater than 70 years of age. Uh, majority had PS of 1. Majority of patients had head and neck uh, location. There were um, distant disease in about a quarter of patients, 60% uh, had lymph node disease, and there was local disease in about 10%. Best overall response rate, uh, complete response was uh, 5.1, partial response 33%. So the op uh, objective response rate was 38.5%. Remember, this was a small study, 39 patients. I think it's too early to know whether these numbers just as in the locally advanced uh, multiple surgery population, whether these patients are, are uh, uh, different than, uh, <clears throat> or whether these response rates are different than the 50% that I'm usually quoting patients with when I discuss uh, uh, semiplomab. Uh, PFS uh, has been reached at 14.2 uh, months, uh, and overall survival has not been reached for these patients. In terms of adverse events, the toxicities that are seen in this elderly population are not any different than what you would expect in patients uh, with an anti-PD-1 therapy or what we're seeing in the semiplomab study. So in summary, um, the definition of advanced uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is in transition. Uh, we're uh, this is a discussion between a, the, a multidisciplinary group uh, to see whether systemic therapy is appropriate for a certain patient or whether surgery or radiation is the best option. Anti-PD-1 therapy with drugs like semiplomab or pembrolizumab provide an option for patients with advanced uh, uh, disease. <coughs> it has acceptable toxicity. There are some patients who will run into trouble, so they have to be monitored closely. And most importantly, there's the possibility of long-term benefit for these patients. I do believe that uh, these uh, data will result in changes in the practices uh, for uh, surgeons, uh, general surgeons, as well as head and neck surgeons and plastic surgeons as we treat these patients, as well as radiation oncologists and medical oncologists as well. So it's uh, now time to take some additional questions. Um, uh, the uh, email address as well as texting and the button is shown on, uh, on this slide. So I'm going, I have a couple of questions here. What do you do for your patients with multiple squamous uh, uh, cell carcinomas of the skin? So <coughs> this, is, this is a very uh, reasonable question. So, all of the studies have been performed in patients who really had large disease or had disease that were, was in a sensitive area that you wouldn't want to give therapy. 
And, but we do have patients uh, in all of our practices who have basically a squamous carcinoma. Every time you see them, every three or four months, there's a new lesion to be removed. And, um, and, and we've had uh, uh, patients like this in our practice recently where the question has come up, well, I could remove it, but they're going to have to, they're gonna, but they're going to be more to remove in three or four months. Does it make sense to, to give uh, the semiplumab drug now? And I, in our practice, we have a discussion with the patient uh, regarding that option. Uh, and uh, uh, it is off-label, so I think that if it truly is something that is resectable or treatable with radiation, we should be uh, treating patients with what we know to be the most effective therapy. And the main reason, and it's very important to remember this, is that systemic therapy works in 50% of the cases, and, or maybe a little bit more, maybe 55%. And about a third of those patients will have progression afterwards. As my uh, colleagues in surgery like to tell me, they have a 100% success rate for what they remove, or at least a really good PR rate, uh, partial response rate. So if a patient has an easily resectable lesion or a lesion that's easily radiated, um, uh, uh, the standard of care would be to move forward with uh, local therapy for those patients. In patients, however, where surgery would cause a, quite a lot of morbidity or uh, patients who, um, for whom uh, radiation is not possible, uh, the immunotherapy uh, would be my first choice in patients who do not have an exclusion. Um, the question regarding uh, uh, immune suppression, we will use semiplumab in patients. I wouldn't use semiplumab in a patient who had a surgically resectable disease. Uh, and um, for patients who have a solid uh, organ transplant, uh, or other or bone marrow transplant, we certainly would investigate the um, uh, semiplumab in those patients. But in other patients with CLL or other uh, second cancers, we may consider uh, treatment with uh, uh, semiplumab first, uh, but this is a discussion uh, with the patient and, and weighing of the pros and cons due to the fact that there may be uh, toxicities. And, and clinically, we have the impression that patients with uh, CLL, for instance, may have some uh, issues with uh, toxicity when given anti-PD-1 therapies. Oh, and uh, the uh, other question that, that came up was, are there any additional questions, uh, sorry, are there any patients who would not treat with uh, anti-PD-1 therapy? Well, if the choice is uh, possible living versus a succumbing to the cancer, uh, then uh, we will have a discussion with patients, all patients, regardless of uh, their um, uh, history. Um, right now, the, t the most difficult patients that we uh, uh, speak or are reviewing are patients who have an autoimmune condition. Uh, diseases like lupus could be exacerbated. Um, multiple sclerosis could be exacerbated by anti-PD-1 therapy. It, uh, there have been examples in the literature of patients who have st stabilized their uh, immune, uh, autoimmune condition and have been successfully treated with these therapies. There are also patients who have had significant worsening of, of uh, these uh, um, uh, conditions due to um, um, uh, immunotherapy. So uh, referral to a multidisciplinary team that includes uh, uh, expert in uh, these um, uh, rheumatologic or other diseases is necessary. In terms of patients with uh, uh, solid organ transplants. Uh, we have had discussions with patients with uh, liver, lung, heart transplants, 
and uh, there, are, and that's uh, uh, basically uh, there is no data to to be reassured that it's a safe uh, procedure, but something that uh, can be discussed to look at all options uh, for these patients. Uh, and any additional questions? Um, um, we've seen no additional questions with uh, the group. Shall we conclude? Uh, so I think we'll uh, conclude and uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar.